Coming up with the Brooklyn Nets new head coach in place and the NBA playoffs rolling along, we take a look at the impact of the Eastern Conference on the Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes and just how juicy have those Phoenix Suns picks come off of the Kevin Durant trade. We dive in. All coming up next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, yes, my friends, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. He's Doug Nori. I'm Adam Armbrecht. We thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. We are 100% free on all those great platforms. Doug has returned from assignment over the last couple of days, taking care of some business. And now we get to talk about not only the playoffs, not only the draft picks, Doug, but also coming off of the Jordy Fernandez hire. Big talking point, Nicholas Claxton, the future, the free agency. Seems like we have some real breadcrumbs to follow into the offseason for the Nets. Yeah, tons of stuff going on here. Obviously, playoff basketball is going to impact a lot of like sort of what we end up talking about this offseason, too. It's it's actually cool the way that this is unfolding in the NBA landscape. You know, we're recording this Thursday morning, so it's prior to Cleveland playing Orlando uh, again for game three. But I joked about it on, on social media a few like a week or so ago. I was joking. I was like, you know, no, no matter what happens, these playoffs are all about the Nets. Uh, just joking about how like, you know, Nets fans want to do nothing more than to play superstars here. And, and I get it. The organization has uh, has signaled that clearly. And while I don't think it's all about the Nets, I do think this the these playoffs are going to end up being ground shifting kind of ones for the NBA landscape, depending on where teams land. Because there's a lot of different scenarios here about teams stay together slash teams break up that are going to be influenced by where teams, uh, I said teams a lot, but where they ultimately fall in landing in or out of the playoffs. Of and frankly, there's not enough good positions for every team to feel and player to feel happy when it's all over. So you just know there's going to be discontent here. And it's, re and it's really just a waiting game now to see who it's going to end up being because like I said there's just not enough there's not enough final landing spots for everyone when you consider what everyone's kind of hopes and dreams are when it comes to these playoffs. And by the way uh on what was uh Wednesday night leave it leave it to the Miami Heat to do the very oh, Miami yeah. Heat thing and be like hey you know, here's a little wrinkle. Maybe the Miami Heat make it a lot harder for Boston and they don't look like that vaunted Eastern Conference foe that everyone assumes, yeah, finals, they'll be there. It's just a matter of who they have to walk through to get there. Like, only the Heat, while not having Jimmy Butler, could do that thing on the road and really throw a wrinkle into what is the first kind of talking point that I wanted to get to here. Uh, but just, just quickly, between that and we're also going to talk about picks, what's going on in the Western Conference, the Phoenix Suns, like, there already are. Very interesting. There's a couple of very interesting series that are ha unfolding right now in both conferences that start to, to your point, just elevate things that could shift. And, and, and especially for teams that you wouldn't have thought would be making different decisions coming out of these playoffs. Now we're talking about m maybe, you know, we'll see how it all unfolds. But a couple of teams could be going, oh, we need to make a new move. We need to maybe move a player we didn't anticipate. We need to go throw more well assets to bring in another guy, right? I mean, not to bury the lead here too much. It's just going to end bad for some of these teams. Like, yes. because it, like, someone's just playing each other. Like, Clippers and Mavs play each other. Like, one of those two teams is going to be out. Yep. And they're going to have to do some real self-reflection about, like, what the path is going forward. Like, so you just know, just to start there, that's going to be the case. I mean, even Suns-Wolves. Suns look kind of dead in the water here, but... If they were to come back, the Wolves would have to do some real soul searching yes. about what's going on with like Gobert and Towns. So like, so even those two situations, and and there's more too, like Milwaukee, Indiana. Maybe Milwaukee. that's a little less because Giannis isn't playing, right? So like, it's hard to tell. Philly and New York, one of those two yeah. teams is going to walk into that series and just look back and say we don't have enough, right? So you already just know it's it's inevitable. We already know that some round one is already set up to have significant talking points. And then just go another round deeper, and there's probably just going to be another layer of it. So I, like, we're just already set up there. And one of those funny ones you mentioned there, Phoenix, by the way, they are fascinating because they have guys like Tobias Harris. They have guys uh, like Kelly Oubre. They have a number of players that are going to be coming out of that team this offseason with decisions to be made about them along the way as well. So, yeah, it's littered throughout. And I'll just say that for the sake of the Donovan Mitchell conversation, because there's more interesting things, including the Phoenix Suns picks here, including Nicholas Clax, that we're going to get to kind of a mailbag catch-all. Had a lot of people talking about these things. Jack Manuel, friend of the show 
mentioned, like how closely are all Nets fans watching Donovan Mitchell? And when I looked at that, combined with Miami beating Boston, it, 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 the thought that I mentioned on the end of yesterday's episode for everyone to tease him was, well, what has to happen here for Cleveland and Donovan Mitchell for it to all of a sudden become really unlikely that he leaves the Cavs? And if Miami's going to make it hard for Boston, and in a world where it wasn't Boston waiting for Cleveland, who looks like they're going to take care of Orlando, can't assume it. I, I, I just keep wondering, what is the level of success that Donovan Mitchell needs to have with that team for him to go, well, okay, I, I can be successful here. And for the Cavs to say, what do we need to add? What do we need to go do this offseason to make it even more enticing and push the Cavs into a top three kind of seed in the Eastern Conference going forward? That makes it way more palatable, even if it is coming home, than starting over and not knowing yeah. what that's going to look like elsewhere. Well, I mean, if they make the Eastern Conference finals, the Cavs, I, I think that like that he'd be hard pressed to ask out. Right. Like if they make the Eastern Conference finals and are even moderately competitive, let's say. And I don't think that's a crazy thought at this point. No. I mean, well, I mean, I guess it does a little bit with the seeding because that to go th probably, you know, end up having to go um, through I mean, through Boston. Yeah. So yeah, like Boston, you, you'd end up. Uh, but I mean, if they're even competitive in this next round, let's say let's go the next round. If they're competitive in the next question. round, how successful do they need to be against Boston to mean that he would stay? Right. Like, what is it? Seven game series? Six game series, but very competitive. All six, like right, there has to be a threshold there. Yeah, I think that that would probably probably be enough. I like it's hard to think that he could go to a better situation than that. I mean, the, it's funny because these playoffs are in some ways really competitive, but then I think that in the end we're going to see these other these teams like be be much better, like Denver and Boston, be much better than everyone else. I, right. I think like that's still I'm still holding pretty tightly to that, even with that Celtics Heat thing, but I it's just hard to imagine yourself going to like much better situation. The Nets will okay, let me put it this way. The Nets wouldn't be that situation, right? I, I it'd, be, you'd be, it'd be imp almost impossible to look at that and say, we're going to be better. The Nets would be better than this current Cleveland iteration in a year, maybe right. in two years, but then you just have to really use your imagination to how the roster fills out. And so the, I don't know. I, 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 I I wonder if even just beating the magic is enough. I, I mean, like sort like you know beating the magic. Maybe they if they sweep the magic, win in five, something like that, and get into the next round and, and are really competitive in the next round. Maybe that is just enough. And I I wonder if we've just under. I wonder if the Cleveland flame out from last year against the Knicks is standing too front and center around like sort of what the ideas are around him, yeah. especially yeah. if they just course correct. This year, I mean, they have a few guys that like were their big problems last year. The big problem last year, they had they didn't have a three who could, they didn't have a small forward who could shoot threes. Like it was like the main problem. Like yeah. they just couldn't hit a three. Well, now Max Struess, I don't know, does he solve enough of that? Okora's hitting threes this year. Is that just enough to kind of put them over the hump with their clear lack last year? It could be. And if it is, I don't know. Short of everyone kind of switching teams in the off season. It's, it really kind of would be hard to use your imagination to find a better situation. And between it being Milwaukee, obviously without Giannis, but they're getting a little bit older, key positions, right? The Dame Lillard timeline, Philadelphia could be in a weird spot. And even Boston, well, Miami, even Miami might go after him. Like, you know, and, and, and he might look at that situation and be like, that's much better, right? Oh, actually, like that's you know a what? much better what situation. We just slipped that one right in at the wire here, the first segment. That's actually true, too. It's like, what are the other Eastern Conference teams that he might want to go to that are showcasing themselves better? Miami loses in six, loses in seven to Boston. They get knocked out. Okay, fine. But then you go and play against them. And the way that Boston looks across the Miami series and maybe head-to-head -head with Cleveland, hey, they're not as far ahead of us as we think they are. So all of that to say, when we start to have these narratives around Donovan Mitchell, to, to your point, Oh, a year ago, it was this narrative. Well, it's a whole another year later, and everything looks a lot different. Coming up here in a second, let's turn our attention not only over to Phoenix and what those picks look like, but how that holds weight into this offseason and an interesting note from both Sean Marks and new head coach Jordy Fernandez on one Nicholas Claxton. We'll get into that coming up next. All right, I'll tell you about our friends over at Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? You ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. You got the 2024 Nissan Rogue. That's perfect for city drives, those great escapes. You got the class exclusive uh, Google built in. It's always updating assistant. You can call on for almost anything. Don't worry about connecting your phone. The Google Assistant, Google Maps, Google Play Store are all built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment 
system, the 2024 Rogue, is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. You also have the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. It's got room up to eight, expansive cargo capacity, advanced available 4x4 capability. Get off-road, people, with 200, 284 horsepower, up to 6,000 pounds of towing. That's when Adventure calls. The Pathfinder is there to answer. You got the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, throw in the Nissan Armada as well, and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. And I want to let you know this next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes you all need the opportunity to get stuff off of our chest, the big stuff, the small stuff, just certain things can really start to get to you over time. It's important to let it all out, especially to someone who is unbiased in your life. Maybe you're feeling good about something. Maybe you're not feeling so great about something. Talking to a therapist can be the way to kind of start to move through some of this stuff. Uh, make you feel authentically upset, sad, excited. All that stuff is great to get out there, start talking about, and start making yourself feel better. Uh, if you're thinking of starting therapy, you want to give better help a try. Those big problems, the small problems, it's all there to work through with a licensed therapist. They're going to get matched with someone who works for you. It doesn't work. It's all right. You switch anytime. It's work. It's all online. It's built around your schedule. It's flexible and suited to the times where you need it the most. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. You're going to get 10% off of your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on MBA. All right, so as we continue today's Locked On Nets, a bit of a mailbag edition because we pulled a few different threads from across it. Coming out of the Jordy Fernandez higher, I'll tie this into the, the Phoenix draft picks and what's going on in the Western Conference as well as we get back to NBA playoffs. But when I, and I talked about this yesterday, Nicholas Claxton, he's a priority, wants to be a part of it. Shout out to big time fan, long time fan, Clash Bandicoot. It's disgusted by the entire premise, Doug, that Nicholas Claxton would be retained, that the Nets would want to keep him, need to spend the money elsewhere. But the thing that I came back to and didn't get into yesterday was when you go look at it in terms of allocation of money, even if we want to say it's going to be $20 million, and I'll get your take on whether or not we think it's ironclad that Claxton is back. But remember, a year from now, between the uh, Dennis Schroeder contract, the obviously Big Ben Simmons contract, and the moving, we assume at some point, of Dorian Finney-Smith, there's $70 million coming off the books when you go into the following offseason. I don't think that retaining Nicholas Claxton is punitive from a moves you can make standpoint, let alone that we got a sample size with him and Noah Clowney, that I think it makes sense to keep him around and see what it looks like as you reshape this young core roster. Are you do you agree that they're that you can trust the words of Fernandez and Marks and that whatever the number ends up being, barring it significantly into the 20 millions, that it's okay to keep Nicholas Claxton around in the short term? Yeah, the money matters. I think here now. I would. I take the. Assuming I, I would it's not, not gonna get crazy, right? Like, okay, we'll see that. But that's where I'd like. I, it's hard to trust, right? So it's like, for the, for starters, I don't think that them saying that about Claxton means that like a deal is imminent, right? I think that is a very easy thing to say that you can always back out of when you, when someone else offers a bigger contract and you just say we just wanted to keep money money open. Like I think that's super easy to say you like a player and not re-sign them, especially if someone else just comes over the top, right? And so well, is, I don't... Go ahead. It is funny, just real quick, that, that Mark said it as, he's like, our hope is we want to, right? He mentioned it in a way that sounded like caveats. Fernandez, I will say, though, just the way that he spoke about him, he's like critical to what we want to do here going forward. Yeah, like but, He said it in a way that seems specific, but, but you, the good point you make is, eh, somebody offered him $23 million a year. Like, we, we do want him back. We did want him back, but it was just too much for us, right? You can always But that's out. perfect good cop, bad cop mentality that you should have, <laughs> right, right? right? Like, right. which is coach who does not handle the contracts loves ever can love everybody right mm -hmm. and love everybody equally and then you know bad guy who does the contracts can be the one who ultimately decides it. so I, that actually doesn't mean anything to me either like he's not okay. the one jordy fernandez does not negotiate the contracts now he probably i'm sure he has significant input and that matters but he can have input all the way up to the to the very end and then you can just say the money doesn't work so i think that like when you look at how you should structure well, that structure, how you should get messaging out around players. Like I would do the same exact thing. Go say all the things, like every supporter yeah. in the world about the guy, because if he ends up playing for you, you want to have said all the nice things. And if he doesn't, it's not his fault. It's Sean Marks yeah. <laughs> like that, like the, or Joe Sy, because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get enough money. Like you just have the bad news kind of roll up to the top a little bit more. So I don't think to me that really didn't move the needle in terms okay. of how I thought about whether or not they would resign him. I just think those are like the obvious answers to not say it that way would have been an epic fumble. Probably. Well, I, so I think that I just didn't. Yeah. 
Yeah, the other interesting part of that too was just, and, and it's interesting one because rarely on the on the show, but but Doug and I are, agree, disagree on this. I thought because the question came from the Nets PR department, so it was like, hey, we're gonna ask you, the, we're gonna ask you about Nicholas Claxton. They didn't talk about any other players in, in a relatively brief introductory press conference. It wasn't, how do you feel about Mikael Bridges? How do you feel about Cam Johnson? How do you feel about these players? It was only Nicholas Claxton got brought up. So to your point. Maybe I think it's the forward facing of let Claxton know we really do like you. We do want you here. And then I think it's about how the market develops. The, the best part about this is you say these really nice glowing things. Now the market is soft for him and you still get him at a, at a good contract price where he feels valued, but you didn't have to overpay him in order to retain him if you're getting into a battle. So we, we can button that one there for a second, because I do think that the dovetail off of this to loop back around as we do our mailbag into the Phoenix picks. And this care, uh, front of the show, Robin Lumberg, who was like, my God, are those Phoenix picks looking delicious right now? If Phoenix goes down here, I think the other way that you can make it palatable to keep Nicholas Claxton is that in the background, off of what Jordy Fernandez was saying, we want to have long-term success, building young talent. All of a sudden, whether it's pursuing stars next off season or just having draft capital, those picks look like, even if Phoenix turns it around this year in these playoffs, those look like those picks are going to be very valuable down the road, whether it's drafting or utilizing in trades. And I think that that can inform whether or not you keep Nicholas Clash in the short term or anybody, because you know we have these assets in the pipeline that have gone back and forth in terms of where their value was going to lie, at least right now, down 0-2 in the playoffs. Feels like the Phoenix picks are going to be as valuable as they've ever been. It feels that way. Um, I will say that there's a long, still, a long, I hate to douse water. No, no, on this playoffs thing. are long, though. Yeah, series are playoffs long. Playoffs are long. You go down 0 -2, like, it doesn't mean the end of the world. It it doesn't. And I, I, I'm not of the same, like, I know there's a lot of people, I know there's ideas that, like, oh, they lose this one and everyone asks for a trade. I'm not totally convinced that that's going to be the case. Uh, like, these guys probably, like, I doubt you would see Booker ask for a trade. To be for to, for starters, like he just he's been in Phoenix's one, career. Yeah, what's that? He's the last one that requests. A it really feels that way. Like I like I'd be shocked if he did. I'd really be shocked if Durant did again at this point. And Beal is like completely untradeable. So I think at least for next year, you see them. Even if they were to flame out in this series, that you would see them probably end up running it back just because they don't really have anything else now. They are in real big trouble going forward with the repeater stuff and how much money that they're going to end up spending. And it, it does look like it's going to be hard for them to get a lot better. We're still so far away from some of those picks that there are some probable ways that they could retool a little bit to not be horrible. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, and I think that like, I don't know, I'm still going to take the wait and see approach. Cause remember like the rocket stuff, you know, think back to, it goes the other direction. But if you think back to the Rockets picks with the Nets, like there was a time not too recently or not too far you know, or recently where those picks weren't going to look that great for the Rockets. Mm -hmm. And then everything changes. Yeah. And it's just hard. So I know Nets fans really want a victory lap, how great these picks will be. And Phoenix becoming just a total dust ball team in the first round here feels like that's going to be the case. It's just so far out to really fully victory lap it. Yeah. And I don't think, I still think there's a world like in 2025, that, like, let's say where the, where the Nets convey that first pick that they're still okay ish, <laughs> right? Like that. They're just not like bottom of the barrel. That's my only, that's my only little caveat there. Yeah. And for sure. And, and you know, really me, my confidence is more when you look at the Western conference and you go, well, the Denver nuggets aren't going anywhere. The thunder are on the come up here. Obviously the number one seed, these playoffs, the Mavericks, they're going to be an interesting team. They're not totally young, you know, but they have Luca, obviously team like the Timberwolves have surprised in the way that they made it through this season and into these playoffs as well. Like when you look around it, it just seems like, hey, the hierarchy of the Western Conference is always going to make it, even if Phoenix does look better, even if they do find a way to retool a little bit, it seems like it's always going to be difficult for them. Like, it's always going to be a hard it, path for sure. to get through the season, the playoffs, the play, and everything else. Look at Golden State, right? Some teams are just falling by the wayside in the Western Conference based on hierarchy, right? Totally. It's going to be difficult for them to win it all. I agree with yes. that. I also think it might not diff be difficult for them to be not be horrible. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. like where which is where the Nets picks, like which is where the picks are really mad. Yeah. Right. Like that's the that's the that's the difference. Is that agreed? Do I think they have any chance to win the title in the next two years? No, I do not. But do I think that they're gonna be, you know, 10 and 72 
in the next three years <laughs> where like those were those um where those picks just look amazing i also don't think that's really that reasonable to expect either so yeah. that's i think the second part gets forgotten forgotten a little easy easier when you think about them not winning the title them not winning the title does not mean that they're the pistons right right, right? and like the I, there's <laughs> and but it's them being the Pistons where it really helps the Nets, and I, yeah. I just don't know if that's ex like that's all that likely. Coming up here in a second, just a quick look at key free agents that are in the playoffs or recently eliminated, and how the Nets can still look to improve this roster even with some financial restrictions. We'll get to that to close out this episode. Coming up next. All right, before we talk about that, we'll talk about our friends over at LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster. And you'll love this for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. Uh, LinkedIn helps you find professionals you can't find anywhere else. Even those who aren't even actively searching for a new job, but they might be open to the perfect role in a given month. Over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats these days. You might not have the time or the resources to hire. They're constantly finding ways to make the process easier. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right. So as we tie a bow on a bit of a mailbag conversation, pulling some threads that tie back into Brooklyn. The other thing that I think about when we're watching these playoffs is all of the guys that are going to be on the free agent market. I had teased this yesterday. I think we need to have the discussion at some point. How do the Nets go find the Jalen Brunson of, of the offseason? A guy that you go and get and don't give a monster max contract to? but ends up kind of being on the fringe of being a guy that should have had a monster contract. That's a big needle mover. And when you look into these playoffs, whether it's D'Angelo Russell with the Lakers right now, whether it was Malik Monk who was in the play-in tournament with the Kings and he's going to be up there on the market, Valanciunas is out there as well. There are a number of players that when you look around, I mentioned that Philadelphia earlier in the episode, when you think about a guy I said they should go and target in Kelly Oubre in the offseason, Buddy Heald, Tobias Harris, there are going to be a number of guys out there on the market and then maybe even at the high level Siakam is it guaranteed that that Indiana has to go all in and, and retain him OG Ananobi you presume they're going to keep him there with the Knicks obviously but there's a lot of there's a lot of players right now that you can be watching that might end up representing that mid-tier get for the Brooklyn Nets and it ties in to say are we going to bring back Nicholas Claxton or are we going to work some sign-in trades are we going to try to find ways to change the shape of this team do you view any of those kind of guys mid-tier type of players getting away from superstar guys where you go, oh, yeah, the Nets can reshape under Jordy Fernandez and be a different-looking team marginally, but drastically improve how the, how the product looks on the court, how these guys work with one another and how they complement one another. It's not easy, but I do think there are some names worth watching here as these playoffs unfold. It, there could be. I will say this this free agent draft class in 2024 is, is really weak, and the yeah, yeah. Jalen Brunson examples are really rare. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. guys who somehow, I mean, he's exceeded expectations every single time, basically, like to, to a, like an unbelievable degree. I think well, it's an amazing story for New York um, or for the Knicks. I do think that it's using that as the we, we need to do this is, is pretty, it just really <laughs> no, doesn't happen we, very often. Well, yeah, we need to uh, make whatever deal with however many devils to have this happen, right? Right, exactly. And like a lot of people and a lot of I honestly too, a lot of other people need to screw up along the way, like the Mavs, <laughs> yeah, yes, right? Yes, like you, yes. you need to have a, a total bag fumble by, uh, by the, the Mavericks first, who just somehow just can't bring, find a reason to resign them <laughs> and then, or just like lowball them. And then after that, like he lands in your lap. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. I, I do think the Brunson thing is an amazing story. I think if you look down the list of even if you go down deep into the free agent list of this for this coming year, now 2025 is a different story. I and mean, there's a yeah. lot of names that are potentially going to be there. I, I'm not sure they all get there because of like, you know, uh, just they'll end up re-upping. Mm -hmm. But this year's group, it's like, <laughs> it's it just it's just not that good, right? Like you have guys like PG with options and LeBron with options. Siakam is going to resign. OG, you have 
excuse me, have to think the Knicks re-sign him. That's why they traded him. I mean, Harden, obviously, you don't want him back. DDR, too old. I mean, just the list goes on and on. Miles Bridges, I mean, there's any chance the Nets bring in that story? No chance, right? Like, um, after after coming out of the Kyrie thing, then you get Claxton. IQ is going to get re-signed. And so, I, I, short of just going through this whole list, yeah, yeah. I really don't think – that the guy is out there. Most of the free agents we, uh, that are out there right now, either we know exactly what they are mm-hmm. or they're just kind of too old. Yeah. And now if we get to 2025, which the Nets are positioning themselves for, the list looks really interesting. Really, really interesting. And so yeah. I don't know if you're like thinking 2024 as the, as the guy, uh, maybe I'm just not creative a thinker enough, but I just don't see the needle shifting guy. To the point where where it's really going to matter, and then with Claxton, it's just hard to kind of figure out what his market's going to be. Yeah, and that's where you know I was I go back to sometimes when you hit it right, and we'll close out on this. Kobe White, I, I said it last off season. I was like, hey, the Brooklyn Nets should overpay, quote unquote, to pull away this young backcourt talent and bring him into the fold because you want to get young guys in the door. Now, who knows? Chicago may have matched whatever it was, but when he signs for what is it, three year, thirty, thirty three, thirty four plus million dollars, or I think thirty six million dollars, you go. Well, yeah, then you look at his season and his playoff run and you wish you had overspent. So it's not even about, to your point, is it a great draft class? No, but there has to be these diamonds kind of in the rough there. And I hate to do it. Sean Marks has shown himself capable of identifying those talents sometimes. So maybe there's that margin move in the end to wrap up a mailbag. It just feels like there's a lot of things happening in the playoffs that are interesting as it pertains to the Brooklyn Nets, whether it's pursuing stars or watching draft capital. There's also a lot of things happening for the Nets going into the offseason. And as you mentioned, a weaker market, does that inflate, deflate? What does it do to the Nicholas Claxton contract discussions when those come up as well? Well, a lot can of I say one narrative. thing about Claxton too? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. One thing that's not going to help Claxton here is how good Hartenstein has been yep. for the Knicks. Um, who is a free agent this year. I'm pretty sure he's a free Let me just actually triple check that. Um, I'm pretty sure he is. And he's been like playoff tested. I'm sorry. I'm he, fumbling. This he yeah, he I is. Okay, I was, I was just, I was Mitchell just Robinson because they have Hartenstein. You know, what are right. they going to do there? Yeah. Because it's like, well, we need a center who can kind of do a bunch of different stuff defensively and offensively. And it's like, well, I don't know. He looks a little better and it's been, and he's doing it in the playoffs. Right. And yep, so yep. that's, that's definitely not going to help the Claxton. Now that, 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 that's a good, maybe a good thing for the Nets. Right. Cause if, as long as you can uh, depress the rest of his market, like the Nets can maybe just say, Hey, this is this the money available. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and it doesn't need to be 20 million. It can be less than that. And I think that my hope around Claxton, and maybe this is just a longer episode later in the off season. I think that they gave Cam Johnson, the, sort of like nice guy, big money in the last mm-hmm. off season. And that is kind of looking like a mistake. Mm-hmm. I'm really hoping they avoid that specific situation. I'm all for guys getting paid as much as they possibly can, but it just shouldn't be at the expense of like getting better other places. So I don't know. I think there's a world where like the Hartenstein thing makes the clacks, makes it actually easier for them to resign them at a, at a, at a lower number. We'll, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. Next off season is very exciting and very interesting. We'll talk about contract numbers and where everybody stands, but Hey, that's the nature of not being in the playoffs. You get to pull on these threads and we'll keep doing it all off season long. All right. Make sure you subscribe to lockdown nets over on YouTube, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be here all playoffs, all off season, breaking down the nets five days a week. Doesn't matter if the nets aren't playing. We're going to be here five days a week, talking everything you need to know about the Brooklyn nets. Uh, no quote. I forgot what I was doing. Happy to have Doug back. One of the all time great poets, me. Oh geez, that was brutal. We've been so good about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go look up a quote real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hold terrible. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah give, just a little bit. <laughs> We're gonna, we can't end the show like that. We've been doing this too long, buddy, and this has been too one of our all time meaningless running papers. gags in the show to end the show. Like now, I'm allowed to quote Adam Armbrecht as the all time great poet when you're out on the show. I do do yeah. that. Now I forget to do the quotes every time. Right. That's but that's, that's different because that's, that's what you do. Well, that's another that's another gag that I always <laughs> forget. You forgetting just feels like you're not trying so it's 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 a little different you got uh, push yourself because no one else is going to do it for you one of the all uh knowing motivational speakers ed hardy oh there we go see that now you did it saved it we're not gonna oh totally by the way we're leaving that whole thing in so we can just both oh, learn from our mistakes one of the all-time great poets we're back again tomorrow talking more brooklyn that's basketball basketball basketball